in charge of this session, which means I'm happy to answer questions, but should we go to the coffee break or answer questions? We can spend five minutes if you feel. Okay, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. So thank you, uh, Dr. Burton. That was excellent. Thank you, Skip. That was excellent. Um, uh, basically, what you're describing is something that our physics colleagues have dealt with for a long time is how do we come to, when you talk about mechanistic, how do you get to the unified theory that mm -hmm. is going to take a long time and a lot of effort to uh, really understand all this? Uh, what, what's your thoughts about the, you know, a focused direction to uh, attaining that unified theory uh, uh, going forward? You know, I wish I had a simple answer to your question because I know that's the key question. I think the bacteriologists need to listen to the virologists. The virologists listen to the worm people. The worm people listen to the apicomplexans and the virologists and the bacteriologists. So in the world of the microbiome, unfortunately, because of the structure of science, we, we have bacteria-focused departments, virus-focused departments. The people who are studying worms are in yet another department. And so we're in silos, but in fact, what we're all seeing are elements of a, larger, of a larger biologic construct, which is very important. So to me, it's the integration of the disciplines. So that's an easy statement to say, because now how do you do that? And um, creating funding opportunities, which require worm people to talk to virus people, that might be interesting. Um, making the, the virologists actually pay attention to their bacterial colleagues. That, that might be useful. Um, I, I think that that's a, a thing that could cause some of that integration. Secondly is infrastructure. There is no question that the mouse infrastructure in the United States is so variable across institutions that that causes much of the lack of reproducibility. And so even if you have people doing the same experiment, if they're not doing the same experiment under the same conditions, they're not going to get the same results. Okay? And uh, the, the last thing I would say is full disclosure. If you look in the literature, there are tons of knockout mouse papers, and you do not know how those mice were bred. If you're not doing litter mate controls and controlling for the microbiome, I can tell you from personal experience, you will get answers which go away from if you take knockout and compare it to wild type, and you're bearing knockout to knockout, and you go back and you get ready to publish your paper, we've done this, and now you do litter mate controls, some of your phenotypes are going to go away. That science paper that had interferon lambda stout 1 IRF3, okay, that used that graph right before we were going to submit it had NOD2, which would have been the most interesting finding possible because that's a human IBD gene. We got nervous about it. We went back, and instead of submitting the paper, I think it would have been accepted, okay? Uh, paper was accepted. That would have been an added piece of data. We went back and did litter mate controls. Those three genes are true with litter mate controls, and NOD2 disappeared. Okay, so I guarantee you that in the literature, because we're not fully disclosing all the data about how we generate the models, we're having situations where one person gets one result, one person gets another result, and it isn't the competence of the people or whether the postdoc was good or whatever. It's literally that there are variables that have not been accounted for in the publications. That's a long answer, but those are the things I think a lot about. Balfour. Yeah. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. And the, the concept of trans kingdom goes uh, also to others as well. Uh, Mahmoud uh, Ghanam just published a, a beautiful, uh, I think it was cell paper, uh, in which uh, uh, Candida tropicalis interacted with Serratia. Yeah, Mary Marad just published a beautiful cell paper showing that there's a protist in our mice, yep. and we've gone and looked, and sure enough, it varies across our facilities. I mean, it's it's a beautiful paper, and it's another example. Right. So I, I think uh, you're, you're onto something here. Uh, the the question is the fascinating concept that you could change responses to uh, to subsequent immunologic challenge. Uh, and maybe uh, not only immunization, but disease outcomes as well. What is the critical window? You said young mice uh, in which you're giving viruses. Uh, 
is there a critical window? Can you reproduce that after onset of uh, weaning, after young adulthood? So we did that. The big experiment was starting, I think, at five or six weeks. But we've given individual herpes viruses to animals that are 12, 16. doesn't matter. It's the establishment of the chronic infection, we think, not that that chronic infection was established at two weeks of age. Now, we haven't carefully shown that, and there's people who are going to speak here who've clearly shown that there are age-dependent changes right. in the immune system. So it isn't that we've ruled out that there could be a difference, but we know the effects that we see here for the herpes viruses at the least and the, the norovirus, they're not age-dependent. And by implication, I'm suge you're suggesting that the chronicity of inflammation is not uh, indicative of age of uh, infection either. We haven't carefully quantitated whether a chronic infection in initiated at two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks would be quantitatively the same. What we know is that it is big enough difference to give a phenotype. So we haven't answered that specific question. All right, thank you very much. We're at a coffee break now, right?